This video was brought to you by Brilliant. West Africa might be on the brink of a regional war following last month's coup in Niger, as a regional bloc has threatened the military with an August 6th ultimatum. Cede power back to the president or face military intervention. But unfortunately for an already unstable region, coup leaders from neighboring nations have vowed to fight back. So in this video, we'll explain what happened and explore the potential for conflict. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. Firstly though, let's quickly summarize what happened in Niger. On July 26th, the presidential guard detained and ousted the elected president, Mohamed Bazoum. His government was then deposed, the constitution suspended, and a military junta formed. In response, the Economic Community of West African States, or ECOWAS, from which Niger has been suspended, was quick to condemn the coup and impose immediate sanctions on the country. These included the closing of borders, banning of flights to and from Niger, halting financial transactions, freezing assets, and ending aid. Now, these sanctions are broadly in line with how ECOWAS responded to recent coups in Mali, Guinea, and Burkina Faso. However, the bloc has actually gone a whole lot further than just sanctions in this instance, by threatening to use force against Niger's military junta. That's because ECOWAS have said that if the military don't cede power back to President Bazoum within a week, i.e. by Sunday the 6th of August, then the bloc would, quote, take all measures necessary to restore constitutional order in the Republic of Niger. Such measures may include the use of force. In response, Niger's new military rulers warned against such action, saying we want to once again remind ECOWAS or any other adventurer of our firm determination to defend our homeland. But this head-to-head -head between ECOWAS and Niger isn't where this end, because military junta leaders in neighboring Mali and Burkina Faso have said that they would treat any ECOWAS intervention as an act of war against themselves, adding that they would come to the defense of Niger, raising the prospect of a full-on interstate conflict in the region. For their part, Guinea's military rulers have not said that they would join the fight, but they have described the sanctions against Niger as illegitimate and inhumane, going on to say that military intervention would lead to the collapse of ECOWAS. Now, a few days later on Wednesday, ECOWAS's security commissioner said that the military option was a last resort, but Barr added that they have to prepare for the eventuality. But while that might be true that they ought to prepare for the future, ECOWAS's threat of military intervention is something that the bloc didn't do in response to recent coups in Mali, Guinea, and Burkina Faso. So it's worth exploring why they think things are different this time versus other recent similar coups. Now, for starters, ECOWAS's threat may have come from the fact that its mostly sanction-based response to recent coups has resulted in very little progress being made towards democratic rule in either Mali, Burkina Faso, or Guinea. Speaking about their potential response in Niger, the chair of the ECOWAS defense chiefs said that our decision will send a strong message about our commitment to democracy, our intolerance for unconstitutional changes of government, and our dedication to regional stability. Additionally, since June, ECOWAS has been chaired by the Nigerian president, who is seeking to use Nigeria's significant weight in the region to reassert the bloc's authority, with Nigeria at its helm. Or, or as the bloc's security commissioner said, there is a need to demonstrate that we cannot only bark, but can bite. Now, Nigeria does have good reason to be concerned about the coup in Niger. The two countries share a border, and both countries face violent insurgencies from the likes of Boko Haram and other Al-Qaeda and IS-linked groups. So any collapse in security in Niger risks spilling over the border into Nigeria, which is something the Nigerian authorities obviously want to avoid. 
One of Nigeria's biggest steps so far in the hopes of preventing this is cutting off its supply of electricity to Niger, because they are heavily reliant on Nigeria for up to 70% of their power. As such, rolling blackouts have been reported in Niger's major cities. Additionally, while ECOWAS didn't use the threat of military intervention in other recent coups, it's worth noting that the bloc have launched other interventions in past decades. The last one being in the Gambia in 2017. That operation, led by Senegal, saw troops enter the small country to force the then president to cede power to Adama Barrow after he was defeated in the 2016 election. Now, the operation in the Gambia was successful and was met with little to no resistance, but things would likely be very different in Niger. For starters, Gambia is a tiny country surrounded by ECOWAS member Senegal, and as such, the army made essentially no attempt to resist the intervention. Niger, on the other hand, is one of the largest countries in Africa, shares two borders with military-led allies, Mali and Burkina Faso, and all three have stated that they will fight back. But it's also worth pointing out that some have questioned exactly how much help Burkina Faso and Mali could really offer Niger in the event of a full-on war. Both countries' militaries are struggling to quell insurgencies in their own territory, and have limited options to transfer troops and hardware to Niger. On the other side, though, Nigeria would naturally play the biggest role if ECOWAS did indeed decide to intervene, due to both its geographical proximity and the fact it has the strongest and best equipped military in the region, and has also taken the harshest line against the junta so far. Additionally, Senegal, Côte d'Ivoire and Benin have confirmed that they would be willing to contribute troops if ECOWAS did decide to intervene. But the one big remaining question is that if war were to break out, to what degree would outside powers get involved too? The US has around 1,100 troops based in Niger, while France has upwards of 1,500, as part of efforts to help authorities fight insurgent groups in the region. But would an ECOWAS military intervention receive anything more than vocal support from the likes of the US, EU, France and so on? Or would Western nations prefer to keep their distance and avoid accusations of neo-colonialism and avoid the risk of being drawn into a war? Now, ousted President Bazoum is already clearly thinking about this, with him keen to solidify support from the US beyond just words. Writing in the Washington Post, a call for the US government and the entire international community to help restore our constitutional order. Conversely, on the side of the military juntas, how involved would the Wagner Group and Russia be? After all, hundreds of Wagner fighters are already in Mali at the invitation of the military government following the expulsion of French troops. Now, we don't know for sure how much these outside players will get involved, but the biggest winners, for lack of a better term, may well be the jihadist insurgent groups, which are already wreaking havoc in the region. The general insecurity created by a conflict, plus diverting troops and resources towards fighting a neighbouring military, means weakening efforts to fight insurgents, creating the opportunity for these groups to extend their reach. Now, despite this risk, a full regional conflict does look like a real possibility. European countries have evacuated hundreds of their nationals from Niger, and at the time of writing, ECOWAS defence chiefs continue to meet in Nigeria to draw up plans, and the Nigerian military has reportedly been ordered to prepare for deployment. Meanwhile, Niger's military junta remains defiant. But whether either side is bluffing and might back down remains to be seen and it's honestly hard to tell what either side is thinking, especially in a world which is more and more led by fake information and AI manipulation. And it's also increasingly easy to manipulate and deceptively use data. That's why as part of our journalism at TLDR, we're brushing up on our data and analysis skills over on Brilliant. For instance, their Predicting with Probability course has helped us better understand how projections and forecasts work, and therefore help us better identify when something suspicious is going on with government forecasting. 
or take their hypothesis testing course, which allows us to better analyze people's claims and also test our own assumptions and theories. It's not just statistics either. The interactive and engaging courses over at Brilliant take you through all kinds of important topics, from the worlds of maths, science, and computer science. And as we all know, these are increasingly important topics in our modern world, and all of these skills can definitely help with your educational journey or career path. So take a positive step in your learning and check out everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days by clicking the special link in the description. And the first 200 of you to do so will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription.